Hey, welcome to the Upland Nation podcast. I'm Scott Linden, your host. I'm glad you could be with me today, tonight, middle of the night, early morning, whenever you're listening. Great show in store for you. Lots to talk about regarding the Federal Aid and Wildlife Restoration Act. I know it sounds like a lot of bureaucraties, but you and I are doing a lot for wildlife out there. We're going to find out exactly how that works. In the meanwhile, get ready for a public access tip, some hunting strategies and dog handling advice, and of course the Upland trivia question and a prize for one of you lucky listeners out there. It's all coming up on the Upland Nation podcast, so stick around. I'll be right back. Thank you to our sponsors, including Sage and Breaker. If you'd like more information, it's sageandbreaker.com. High quality gun care and cleaning supplies and equipment. Stock up for the season. Now is about the time you're going to wonder where all of your gear is and how to take care of it. Sageandbreaker.com has a dozen new products coming online, including a range bag. Free shipping for everyone all the time. Just register at sageandbreaker.com and espamerica.com. I learned a long time ago that protecting your ears is as important as protecting your eyes. Starting at 900 bucks, some great hearing protection that also allows you to hear the bird flush, your dog's collar tags jingle, and everything else that makes a day a field enjoyable. ESPAmerica.com. And joining me on the line right now, Ed Carter. He's the president of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, and also his day job is the executive director of the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. What a mouthful, Ed. Do you have to say that every time you introduce yourself? You no, know, I don't. I usually say, hey, I'm Ed, and that's about it. <laughs> you know, you're you're down there in Tennessee near Nashville, and... Uh, um, you, you probably, uh, visit Washington DC way more than you'd care to, but we appreciate your hard work on our behalf. And, and why don't you start with that? Tell us a little bit about the association of fish and wildlife agencies and why we need an association of bureaucrats for lack of a better term. <laughs> well, it actually goes all the way back to 1902 and there were a few, Few things happening, and you know, in that era of conservation, where a lot uh, Teddy Roosevelt had begun his his initiatives, and a lot of people were looking about what was going on in the United States, and, and so about five states got together and said, you know, we need to to talk among ourselves to find out what we can do to better enhance wildlife management across this, the United States, and and it's particularly our four states, and then it grew from that to eventually all the states, all the territories. And now we also have, I'm talking about the U.S. territories, but we now also have all the Canadian provinces except for Ontario who will be joining us this, this fall. So essentially that's exactly what we do. We take all the wildlife agencies, we get together, try to look at what federal legislation is going on, we look at funding initiatives, we look at the current diseases that are going around, interaction between states, uh, reciprocal agreements, all those kind of things that are way more boring than actually being out in the field and doing that work, but, but pretty important. Oh, absolutely. And I, it's funny, I, I noticed in the last, uh, I've been a student of, of this kind of stuff for a long time, and I noticed that um, it used to be the Association of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Agencies, and I was wondering uh, why you haven't crossed the border, but it sounds like that's been taken care of now. We have actually. We actually uh, we're meeting with some folks from from several European and countries and a few Asian countries this year as well. They're not necessarily members, but several of them do come to our annual meeting, which comes up the end of this month. Well, have a good one, that's for sure. So, so here you are. You're running the Tennessee uh -huh. Wildlife Resources Agency. You're the president of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. Excuse me, I have to get a get a breath after that. Um, <laughs> do, do you ever get to go outside and have some fun? You know, on occasion I still do, and boy, it reminds me of why I've got into this business. And we often laugh among ourselves. Actually, we kind of cry more than we laugh, but. <laughs> 
every time that you, you advance in this line, every time you promote, you get actually farther away from why you got into this business to begin with, but still get to go out and touch animals occasionally and f- fool around with fish and do those kind of things that are really fun, but, you know, part of the whole business. Well, if you had to pick it, one thing, if you had to narrow it down for that one one day a year that you're allowed to go out and mess around in the woods, what would you be doing if you weren't talking to me? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. But I really enjoyed back when we were trapping turkeys and moving them all over the place, but we're kind of through with that now, so we're down to fooling around with, with different species of fish, especially invasive ones, and it's kind of fun to be on the water and do that. Well, good for you, and keep up the good work. I know I just saw an article about lionfish and how they're basically taking over the Atlantic Ocean. That kind of scares me, but uh, if you're working on it, I'm sure we're in good hands. Well, I hope so. That's another (laughs) invasive that's heading up the coast. You're exactly right. and Lots of ramifications any time a species starts moving into an area that they've never been in before. You know, just just for the record, yeah, you you would know if anybody would. Uh, you know, out out west where I live, uh, or even in the Midwest, you know, a lot of the uh, the the uh, game birds we pursue are uh, technically introduced species, um, from ringneck pheasants to chucker partridge, Hungarian partridge too, for that matter, and and that sort of thing. Now, that back in the day, those were wonderful ideas, and it was the same for some of the trout that were introduced in Yellowstone, and who knows what, you know, they're everywhere. They're in Kenya now. But, you know, these days, the attitude toward introduced species has, has changed a bit, hasn't it? It has. You have to be really careful and make sure that you you understand exactly what you're doing, and sometimes that's not known for a while, but most of the invasives that we're we're having now have because the world has gotten so much smaller have come in through ballast tanks on boats or people have accidentally tried to do something on their private land and and uh, what animals whether they're terrestrial or aquatic have escaped into the environment and you only have to look to the Everglades to see what's going on down there and know that things change quickly but yes you're right a lot of them were brought in most have been okay because they were brought in for a specific purpose, but every now and then, especially in the pet trade, uh, things happen that shouldn't. Well, let's uh, talk about something more optimistic than that. Um, uh, Senators Pittman and Robertson way back, maybe they're congressmen, I don't even remember now. Yeah. Anyway, way back in the good old days, 1937, were approached by and vice versa sportsmen who said, you know, we'd like to do more for conservation and wildlife management. And that Pittman-Robertson Act became the Federal Aid in Wildlife Restoration Act which um, you're uh, more expert in than I am. Why don't you, g- you know, give me the Reader's Digest version of what that is and what it does. Okay. Uh, just as you said, that there was a, actually a tax on, on long guns and ammunition all the way back in 1919. And it and in 1937, the conversation that you're talking about took place, and hunters uh, from all over the place and, and a lot of wildlife agency personnel said, wouldn't that be great if that were redirected to, to help restore wildlife? And if you, you look back in that time period, that's when a lot of what we would call very common species now were on the brink of really being in trouble, the deer, turkey, and all those that we know. But in any case, it they convinced Congress that that would be a good thing to do. So the, the 11% excise tax that's that the manufacturers get involved to pay as it goes down the line, 11% on long guns and ammo, was redirected to wildlife restoration with some very specific guidelines on what it could be utilized for. And it actually says wild birds and, and wild mammals. So it's restricted to that. It doesn't go to species that at that time predominantly weren't hunted. For instance, non-game animal salamanders and and uh, different kinds of reptiles and so forth. So those are under a different funding model now. But the Pittman Robinson PR funds, as we generally call them, is exactly what that did and had this. It's really what turned the, this country around in terms of wildlife in itself and its habitat. 
you know, uh, I, I wrote an op-ed for the local newspaper a while back, and, and, and it looks to me like a, a, a significant amount of the money that most of our state wildlife agencies, like yours in Tennessee, get come from PR funds. I mean, is, is that true nationwide? Let me just uh, tell us how it gets from a long gun sale, wholesale sale, if you will, transaction, to my local state, my, my state fish and wildlife agency. Okay, I, I'll do the Reader's Digest version on that as well. Yeah, please. There are several <laughs> little nuances. <laughs> but in any case, the, there's a, it's the 11% excise tax that the manufacturer actually eventually writes the check for. Now, how much of that is passed on to to the individual purchase when it's made at the store is, is another story. But in any case, that, that money is paid by the the uh, manufacturer that goes into the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, then each state, and don't just the 50 states at this point and leave out the territories for a second, that money then is divided by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service based on a formula, and the, the formula is 50 percent is based on the, the size of the state, the land area, total land, including waters, and then the other is based on the number of paid license holders. So every time a person buys a license to to hunt, then that goes into 50% of that formula, and then all that's put together, and each state then has allocated an amount of money based on that formula. Again, the land size and the number of licenses sold, and there's a minimum and a maximum. A state, for whatever reason, if they were very small, and most of the territories would be in this case, they can't get less than one-half of 1%, or and you have bigger states, Texas, Alaska, and so forth, that can't get more than 5%. So... Long story short, to recap on all that, it's a half of your it's this formula is based on your state size and how many licenses you sell. Do you have a feel for how, for example, here in Oregon or in Tennessee, which you I I hope trust know intimately, um, how, what what percentage of your overall budget uh, comes from PR uh, PR money? You know, it really does vary by the state depending on what their total budget would be. For Tennessee, it's generally in the 32 to 35 percent of our total budget comes from the Pittman Robinson side of the world. So it, it's a, a pretty significant amount, and it, and that's of our total budget. Mm -hmm. If we were looking at just the wildlife side of, of, of the land, it would actually be higher than that. Yeah. But it, 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 you know, if a state gets a lot of of help from its legislature through public funds, then the percentage goes down, obviously. But a lot of states, including Tennessee, still operate primarily on hunting and fishing licenses. Yeah, which is a, another significant, uh, obviously, revenue stream for agencies like yours. And and just so that everybody understands, we we all know that there's there is a there is a corresponding act in in the fishing side the dingle johnson act and and that does the same thing essentially and then there's one other um major funding source that i sure could appreciate some uh, clarification on ed and that is the land and water conservation fund now um i'm sure you know uh, way more about that than I do. Can you uh, give me again, distill it down to, you know, 50 words. What what does that do and where does that money come from? That's appropriated by Congress, and it varies each year depending on how much uh, the Congress actually appropriates for that act. Uh, this year was a little different. They, it, it was came in at a higher funding rate than normal, and it looks like it will sustain that for a while. That goes back to the states for a variety of reasons. It's a lot of times outside of the wildlife agency. It goes to a lot of the folks that deal in parks and recreation. It has to do with, with the purchase of land and uh, local parks and those kind of things that that aren't necessarily inside wildlife agencies, but same kind of operation in that it, it enhances some kind of outdoor recreation. Yeah, and that money comes from a, t a, a tiny, tiny tax on oil and gas development of some sort, doesn't it? Yes, the, okay. generally on federal lands. Right on. Okay, so there we have it, the Federal Aid and Wildlife Restoration Act, which I like to call Pittman-Robertson, and so do most others, I guess. That's how it works. Um, how can it be used? How can that money, I know there are strings attached, but how is that money generally used by state wildlife agencies once they get it in their bank account? 
you know, it, it, there's a seeing how to really narrow this one down. <laughs> <laughs> It, as I said in the beginning, it, it, it can only be used for wild birds and wild mammals. So outside of that, for instance, law enforcement is, is exempt. You, you can't use any of that money in a law enforcement situation except under really extreme conditions. And, it, and those have very strict guidelines on how that could be. But for, for the most part, law enforcement is not included. So everything that's in there generally breaks down to two or three big areas, and it's a uh, for instance, most states are going to spend it on operations and maintenance of, say, wildlife management areas and those kind of things, research, and then uh, hunter education is involved in that as well. So operations and maintenance, you could probably say usually in most states it's going to run about a third, and in research it's going to be 20 25%. Uh, outside of that, it's it's broken into several different areas like technical assistance and, and capital improvements, but a lot of it also goes toward uh, buying land mm -hmm. and the, or leasing land. And it, that, of course, has to, to be utilized for hunting purposes. It couldn't be bought, in, and when I say hunting, it also includes refuges where you may not actually hunt, but it's for a you know, refuge for waterfowl generally or something like that. So it, it, it's kind of distributed by state and where they think they they need it the most, but one thing to remember is it's not a grant to the state. They have to spend that money, and then they get reimbursed at a 75% basis. So it's not like they're just sending money to you and you spend it, you, you spend it, and then you apply for reimbursement. And every one of those projects that you send in has to be approved before you actually spend the money. And there has to be some skin in the game on the state level as well, it sounds like. Yeah, at least 25%. And and one of the things that really helps a lot of the, the non-government organizations, you know, your Turkey Federations, Elk Foundation, on and on, all all those folks that, that have their own organizations will a lot of times come to a state and say, hey, we have this project and we think this is what would be really good for you name the species. And so we'll put up your 25% match. And then so they'll bring that money in, and you can do that as long as it's not some government agency doing it. For instance, if if the federal government were to give you money to do that, you can't use it as match. It has to come from some other source. So a lot of times that's really helped out state wildlife agencies because everybody's generally strapped for money. So if they can get somebody else to make the match, then nothing is coming out of hunting and fishing licenses in their state. That way it's all federal funds and some other grant coming in from another organization. Love it. That's Ed Carter. He's the president of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. We're talking about the Pittman-Robertson Act. If you buy a gun, if you buy ammo, you're helping to fund wildlife conservation and management right here in your own state, no matter what state it is, and also, to a degree, the U.S. territories. But we won't go that deep into the weeds, Ed. We only got a, another 20 minutes. So... Uh, <laughs> Uh, so so it, it's long guns, it's ammo, it's uh, handguns now uh, at a slightly lower t excise tax. Are the, I mean, we're not being taxed on our hunting vests and our scopes and things like that, are we? No, it's very specific. It's, as you said, long guns and ammo. Uh, it was amended, the First Amendment, I guess, was around 1970 when handguns came in, and you're right, it, they're at 10%. But then in 1972, the archery amendment came in, and it, it is at 11 percent. So it's just archery equipment, handguns, and long guns, and ammunition, and all the other things, tree stands, trail cameras, all those other things are exempt. Um, uh, we'll get into this a little bit more later, but um, but I, I I believe now, maybe in the in the last year or two. Um, uh, some of that money can be used as appropriate for development of shooting ranges. Am I correct on that? Yes. As a matter of fact, uh, when the hunter education side of it, mm. that came in when handguns came in. Half of the money that when, when handguns were first brought in as a part of the excise tax, half of that went to hunter education. So, And there's two funds in that. The, the hunter education has a general hunter education, which is, of course, the classes that most people are familiar with or taking courses. And then that money also includes range construction. And many, many states have done that and built significant shooting ranges. And uh, we have done several of those here in Tennessee 
and they're, depending on the size, they'll, they'll generally go anywhere from a million and a half to about five million each. And it so it takes a little money to do that. And then drilling down a little farther, even at a hunter education money, whatever that, and the same formula is applied to see how much hunter education money comes to that state. Eight million of that nationally set aside and divided up again by the formula to just figure out enhanced hunter education. That that would be like you gone through the course now you you want to put on another course that teaches people not only safety but also here's how you hunt or that, those kind of things. And love love so it. It's, it's, you know, so anyway, can, that's what a lot of states have done it. Uh, uh, I'm going to call some of that even marketing, and I love the idea because one of the questions we have uh, uh, is relevant to that sort of thing. So if, if, you, if you're listening, Jim Kuzilik or Pete Aplikowski, hang on because we're going to get to your questions. Right now uh, here on the Upland Nation, Spiro Mavroides, uh, Yasu, brother, uh, has a question for you, Ed. What has the trend been in total revenue generated by the Pittman-Robertson Act over the last couple of decades? Is it going up? Is it going down? Is there some correlation between those funds, for example, and the number of hunters? Because we all know that's declining. Is there is, is there is there a correlation? There is, and it, uh, it was fairly steady, steadily, steadily growing up until the late 1990s. Uh, and that's where I would say we had our first big boost around 1996. It, it was around $200 million nationally, but then in 2011, it, it went up to about $460 million, and then in 2014, with all the talk about you know firearms and ammunition and all that, I think a lot of people kind of panicked a little bit, and, and that really, they went out and bought a lot of guns, a lot of ammo. It went up to $800 million or so in 2014, and it's pretty much stayed there over the last two or three years. Some years are higher than others, but this year it did go down, uh, and last year was slightly down from that from those peaks. But, again, long story short, it, it's gone from around oh, the 200 million mark up to about 800 million. Wow. And and over the course of the life of the PR Act, it's got to be in the dozens of billions, right? Oh, it it is well over billions of dollars now. Yeah. Yeah, with with 800 million dollars a year, it has certainly amounted up. Wow. All right. Well, listen, uh, we're just getting warmed up around here, Ed, so just hang loose because uh, right about now is when we uh, take a little bit of a break for a commercial message, and then right after that, stick around because I've got some observations and suggestions that you might want to you know, take to heart regarding your dog in our Handling It feature. And thank you, Dakota283.com. Been with us since we started out the Upland Nation podcast. One of the reasons is great stuff. Kennels, crates, whatever you want to call them, and then all the accessories you need, including a couple things that you can get free if you buy their G3 kennel. The first one, if you got a puppy that's growing, get the Forever Insert. It kind of kind of shrinks the size of the big kennel down to puppy size, and then you can expand it gradually. It's free when you buy that G3 kennel. Just coupon code it, Linden FI. Linden, no space, FI for the free forever insert with every purchase of the G3 kennel. New lower prices, it's all at Dakota283.com. And Dogtra, our newest sponsor, these guys have thought out some of the things that I wish I'd thought out, including their new TNB dual electronic controller. Two sets of buttons. You're not toggling back and forth. You run two dogs, two collars, one in the front, one in the back. If you're teaching steadiness and retrieving, for example, like I am with Flick, you don't have to toggle back and forth. You use one set of buttons for the orange collar and one set for the green collar free shipping on purchases over two hundred dollars and i finally twisted their arm at dogtra 10 percent off all products over 200 bucks just use the coupon code s l u n 10 that's s l u n 10 at dogtra.com and take 10 percent off your total price 
You know, I was at a training day last weekend with my NAVDA chapter, and number one, thank you all the folks who uh, spearhead that activity, and then number two, go out and help me pull barbed wire and pick up garbage at our training site. Keep up the good work, everybody. On top of all of that, though, um, I was a gunner for most of the day, and so I got to watch everybody's dog and everybody handling their dogs. And one thing that really was driven home again is how um, how literal dogs think, uh, not just from uh, command A to command B to command C, but also they associate where they learn that command with the command itself. I call it place learning, and I've written about this in my book and a few other places in recent weeks. In fact, that's why I'm talking about it now. So many people said, wow, I forgot all about that, or I never knew about that. Place learning in a nutshell. The dog learns how to fetch. He starts on his woe table, and he goes down off the ramp, and he brings it back. All right, so then you go to the front yard and try it again, and it's as if you are speaking a foreign language because he's in a new place. So here's what I'm doing these days with Flick. You know, he might be a little bit too far gone for my help, but it's working for me. Taking that retrieve again, we start it on the woe table, then we move it right next to the woe table, then we move it 15 feet away from the woe table, and so on and so forth. You know, the pros in agility and behavioral science and in dog training for hunting as well all tell us the same thing. A dog's got to master that command in five to seven and even a dozen different locations before it's truly ingrained in his head. Remember that, place learning, keep that in your head, and maybe you'll have a better dog the next time around. Good luck, and I hope to see you at a coming training day. And we are back. Ed Carter, did you fall asleep during my little lecture? No, I just exercised for a while. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, good. Uh, Maybe you were pounding your fist against the wall after listening to me for so long. I'm I'm afraid to ask. Hey, let's jump right in. Oh, thank you. Yeah, for, for what it's worth. Yeah. Um, Let's jump right in. Ed, 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 again, for everybody who's just joining us, is the president of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, and he also has a day job running the agency in Tennessee that takes care of wildlife. Uh, now, are you guys split up? Do you have a fish agency as well over there, or do you get to do both? We do both. Okay. We, as far as I know, Pennsylvania is about the only one that's split unless yeah. you get into the saltwater side. Yeah, that's right. You're right. They do have a fish agent, whatever they call it. It's a fish commission, I think, is what it's called. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, and I guess wildlife in the broadest sense includes underwater and uh, critters with lungs. Anyway, um, back to back to the topic here. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast, and uh, listener Jim Kozilik has a question for you, Ed. Why not do the same thing? as we're doing with fishing and hunting with tents, backpacks, sleeping bags, climbing equipment, binoculars, cameras, et cetera, et cetera. And I, it's a loaded question because I know there's some history there, but why don't you give us uh, the, the current thinking on that? Why, why aren't wildlife watchers, bird watchers, backpackers, hikers, why aren't they paying an excise tax? You know, that question comes up often, and actually back again in the 90s, there was a thing called the Conservation Reinvestment Act, Mm -hmm. Uh, and it started out actually as under a different name, and then it got to the to CARA, as they call it, the Conservation Reinvestment Act, and that's exactly what that was for, to place some type of excise tax on those items you just mentioned as they related to wildlife. He even was covering things like uh, photography and cameras and th- those things that were used for wildlife viewing, wildlife watching, telescopes, and it, it Made a lot of head headway, but uh, there was a lot of pushback from from both manufacturers and from the public. And the, and the manufacturers, some were thinking, you know, how do I divide that 
difference between those people who buy my tackle boxes, for instance, or or whatever that they would utilize to put camera equipment in, as opposed to those who don't. And how do I know that the people using binoculars are are using them for wildlife and not using them for you know just for whatever you would use binoculars for, spotting scopes or whatever. So anyway, it didn't, didn't get a whole lot of traction, but it eventually did wind up in some funding. That was the first basis really for the non-game funding that came into the states, but uh, none of it went to hunting and, and fishing type things. It was all based for non-game. And recently, uh, as a matter of fact, there's a bill in Congress now that, that has been introduced in the House, yet to be introduced in the Senate, but it's it's uh, called Recovering America's Wildlife Act. And it does it started out doing the same thing, but now is just looking at general appropriation funds as opposed to any specific thing, which started out to be the rec recurring revenue off of, of leases for any kind of minerals off of, of uh, federal properties. But anyway, that's all gone to, off to the side. And, and to get back more pointedly to your question is that, that uh, there was more concern at the time about those animals that had no funding stream at all, for the most part, that being the on-game ones. So that's where we're at right now. But I guess to be specific on that question, it was tried, didn't get a whole lot of traction. Yeah, I remember the 90s, and um, and I was calling that movement the pay your fair share, damn it, act, and it never, <laughs> it never did pass. But if I ever, ever am... Uh, reincarnated, it's going to be as a lobbyist to get that thing jammed down the throats of Congress. But I digress, and I apologize to everybody. <laughs> well, um, the one that we have now, the one that Recovering America's Wildlife Act, it, there was a blue ribbon panel put together by everybody from energy sources to, to sporting goods manufacturers, and there's a lot of really positive dialogue so i think we have a really good chance of moving that forward i love it and we'll watch that carefully because uh, as we all know it's a wacky world inside the beltway there um i got another question from another listener pete aplikowski asks uh how can we tap into pr funds to acquire and establish hunting dog training and testing grounds you know that's one of the bigger issues right now amongst uh us kind of guys and if if now we can use it for hunter education now we can use it for shooting ranges um could we go to our local state wild our state wildlife agency and ask them to help us develop something like this just like the elk foundation goes and says we want to you know acquire that land there for elk uh, habitat is there is there a, a a method is there a, a route we can take for that Specifically for that, there isn't, and the reason being the the language that went into the original PR Act was for yeah. wild birds and yeah. wild mammals. Mm -hmm. But here in Tennessee, I'll give you, and many other states are exactly the same. Our wildlife management areas, of course, are set up for that, for hunting, and and many of the states, again, we do the same here. We'll set up a portion of those WMAs specifically for certain times during the year that they can be used for field trials or dog training and those kind of activities. So even though they're not specifically supported technically by PR funds, they, they really are in the fact that that whole wildlife management area and all the manipulation of the crops and the water and all those things that are on there coming out of PR, uh, it certainly gives an opportunity for people to do dog training and field trials. So uh, kind of a backdoor solution to the problem is uh, let's create more more wildlife management areas with little pieces and little times of year when we can use them. I love that idea. Now, you know, uh, one of the bigger questions that I get fairly regularly, and this is my first chance to ask a, uh, an alleged expert on the subject, um, are Pittman-Robertson funds used to manage uh, endangered species? No, they're not. With the exception, let me let me back up. They are used to manage endangered species if they're a wild bird or a wild mammal. Uh -huh. uh, so, for instance, bats. You know, white nose syndrome has been really, really hurting uh, bats across the United States, and part of your Pittman Robinson funds could be utilized in helping do work for bats. But generally, it comes to like preservation of a piece of property, which then can also be hunted. So 
Yeah. And it, it's kind of a double double way to get to that. But uh, but in some places, things there's also a separate funding source for endangered species. And uh, again, that's another serpentine route to tell you how that gets there. But in any case, a lot of those funds you can use both ways. Yeah. And, so if you had in your your part of the world, if you had things like grizzly bears and wolves and things like that that may have been listed at one time and now have been taken off, or maybe in some places still are, that's a, there's a combination of the way those programs are funded in order to get to those species as long as they qualify. And I never thought about this, but one would have hoped that uh, at least at, at, by this time the Endangered Species Act just like a Pittman-Robertson or a Dingle-Johnson Act had a funding mechanism or has one now or something along those lines. And I know it's not always true, but hopefully that's part of it. That's great. Good to know. You, you, see, um, you, you see this from a, from, a, uh, call from a drone level perspective. You're way up there looking at all of these things all the time, Ed, both at the, the level of Tennessee, but also at the federal and even now the international level. Uh, what do you think are some of the bigger th- bigger threats to the hunting and, and wildlife management world that, that we might be able to actually do something about as individuals? Probably one of the, the things that scares me most is that the, the numbers of people who do hunt is going down significantly and it varies again by state, but we have certainly seen a downward trend and lots of conjecture about why that occurs, whether it's people you know, competing for time or or they've lost touch with rural roots. And we see that a lot with urbanization and, and, in, and in state and federal lawmakers, a lot of those folks where you used to come from very rural areas now do not come from there anymore and have kind of lost that touch. <laughs> And then when you get to a point, so they tell me, I'm not a, a statistician, statistician on this part, but they tell me when you get to below 6% or so of the population that you really lose your your influence. Mm-hmm. And that's about where a lot of hunters are right now, that people who hunt make up, depending again on the state, anywhere from, from about 6 to 10 or 15% of the population. So that influence is going away in terms of how wildlife should be managed and and there's just an awful lot of misinformation and some of it's pure emotion on how people view how wildlife should be utilized and several studies have just come out about where people view animals as traditionalists or as where they have a mutual role or some people go strictly preservation so it's that worries me more than anything else is that trying to use science and wildlife management, which is what all your states do, it gets diluted by well-meaning folks in the most part who have just a, a skewed idea of really how the natural environment works. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I was trying to speak coherently while biting my tongue because, you, man, you have hit the nail on the head there. Um I'm not. Uh, we could spend an entire separate Upland Nation podcast on this one, but I I would love for you as uh, as an expert in your field to just define for us the North American model of wildlife conservation. It, it, the North American model kind of grew out of the public trust doctrine. And the, that again was part of that whole conservation movement back in the restoration days of wildlife for the most part. And it, the, the basic parts of the public trust document was that wildlife is owned by the public at large and held in trust by the government, whether it's state or feds. So, and then the people are, are, the, are the shareholders and the government is the trustee. And then out of that, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, the, carry on. You're 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 getting to it. <laughs> so 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 out of that came the North American model, and the North American model essentially was saying that based on that, there's what we call the seven tenets of the North American model, and the, not to go through all seven of them, but essentially wildlife's in the public trust. There should be opportunity for all. We should not have commercialization of wildlife in terms of like market hunting and those kind of things. And the very 
probably the basic one is that wildlife should be managed on a scientific basis as opposed to a political basis. Thank you. You did. You distilled it for us, and I appreciate that. Uh, Ed Carter, president of the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, also the executive director of the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. Ed, your time is valuable. We want you to go out there and start taking care of wildlife for us again, so I'm going to turn you loose. I sure appreciate your enlightening us to the Pittman-Robertson Act and how it works and how we really need to go out and buy more guns and ammo if we're going to help, aren't we? That helps a lot. Yes, please go to the store today. <laughs> okay. Thank you for being on the program with us. Uh, stick around, everybody else. I'll turn Ed loose. Uh, next on the docket is our public access feature called This Land is Your Land. Ed, thank you, and have a great day. Great to be with you. And I know I'm going to be nagging on you about this one, but it's true. Hearing loss is cumulative. My friends at ESPAmerica.com keep hammering that home to me, and I keep getting reminded of it every time my wife thinks I'm not listening to her. You can prevent that with ESP America's newest Iridian Nano Coating technology that will keep your hearing protection not only functioning right, but safe from damage. The nano coating works by lowering the surface energy of the device, you know, the stuff it's on, and instead of water and sweat spreading and sticking and clogging things up, it all beads up and rolls away. Learn more about the nano coating and everything else at ESPAmerica.com. And Dogdra, don't forget the new, brand new TNB Dual one unit, two dog controller collar, beeper, vibrator, stimulator. It's all at doctor.com. Don't forget 10% off when you use the code SLUN10 on any purchase over 200 bucks. Well, you know how um, our feature goes. This land is your land. Uh, whether it's funded by you or it is owned by you, you being the citizens of this great nation, this is my chance to share some of the places that I love that can stand a little bit more attention as long as it's from ethical, conservation-oriented bird hunters like you. And I hope you will come out and visit me the next time in Mott, North Dakota. Yep, North Dakota gets short shrift when it comes to pheasant numbers, but there are years when they will have more than that other state that shares a second name or some of the surrounding states. Mott is one of my favorite places for a bunch of reasons. I discovered it because one of my gym buddies said, hey, guess what, I bought a house in Mott. I said, why? Well, it's cheaper to buy a house there than to go out and stay in the hotel, even if you're only hunting for two or three weeks. Look for it on the map. It's kind of in Southwest North Dakota. There's lots of private land open to sportsmen. There is also a lot of CRP, there's a lot of public, publicly owned land, whether it's a national grass land or anything else. And there are pheasants and sharptails in pretty strong numbers on certain years. Take a look at the map, get all the information, including an atlas of what's private and what's uh, open to the public through their plots program. It's all at gf.nd.gov. Just Google public access in North Dakota and you'll probably do great. The sharp tails, quite often I've found at least, are near corn, especially uncut corn, on the high spots of CRP grass that are adjacent. Now, one thing I learned from a couple pros in the last few months is uh, that sharp tails won't stay in that short stuff that the Huns like. They like grass that is long enough to wave in the breeze so don't waste your time on the little bald knobs go to the high spots that have tall grass stay out of the unharvested crops it's a law over there and remember that non-residents are prohibited from hunting for the first seven days of the pheasant season on land owned by the game and fish department or on private land in that plots program i talked about 
You can learn more about all of this at the nd.gov slash plots website. And if you have a little free time and you're in the area, don't forget to visit the Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Yes, as a homage to TR and his conservation efforts, but also because it's a great little pocket park with a lot of the things that Yellowstone has, but no people. All right, you stick around because coming up next right after the break is our Upland trivia question, an answer, and a prize for one of you. So hang around. The new, brand new TNB dual, one unit, two dog, controller, collar, beeper, vibrator, stimulator. It's all at doctor.com. Don't forget, 10% off. When you use the code SLUN10 on any purchase over 200 bucks. Welcome back to the Upland Nation. I'm Scott Linden, your host. I hope you'll watch me on Wing Shooting USA, the television show as well, and tell your friends. It's time for our Upland trivia question. Congratulations to Jeff Hall. He recently answered the question correctly. What two separate breeds used to come out of the same litter? They were Cockers and Springer Spaniels. A little one's called Cockers, hunted Woodcocks. The Springers were used for other birds. And did you know that Spring, back then in the day, was the word we now call flush? All right, coming up now, a Yeti Rambler 16-ounce tumbler in fire engine red for somebody who answers this question correctly at scottlindenoutdoors at gmail.com. I'll pick one of the correct answers at random for that Rambler from Yeti. The question is, Deutsch Kurzhaar is the German term for what dog breed? Deutsch Kurzhaar in English means what? <laughs> Good luck, and I'll have a correct answer and a winner of that Yeti Rambler in the next episode of the Upland Nation podcast. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention, for your great questions. If you'd like to talk more, we can talk at the Upland Nation Facebook page. We can talk at scottlindenoutdoors at gmail.com. Tell your friends, I hope you'll subscribe to the podcast. Please leave a good review. Your suggestions and advice are always welcome. Upland Nation Facebook page is the best place to do that. The name of this song is called The Day to Remember. I remember it well because I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Be safe in the field. I'll see you out there.